we're going to look at the bequest, how it was made by Archbishop Robinson, Baron Rokeby, to the public library in Armagh. And here is the portrait of Robinson, uh, now at the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Bordeaux. And it's important to say, but for, but to starting out, that uh, Baron Rokeby had his papers all burned on his death. So there are lots of mysteries around him and around the collection of prints that he bequeathed to Armagh. So as of about a few weeks ago, all these have become catalogued and, and accessible. Uh, so some of these mysteries are beginning to be solved. I just want to start with the, with the five types of print that you are likely to find in the Rokeby collection. Each impression is, is unique, of course, after the plate uh, printed from it, um, which can be changed in the inks can be changed um, unlike digital reproductions. So um, first engraving, which is done with a tool called a burin um, onto a copper plate, which is carved. And then the ink, it goes into the carved areas is squeezed through a press onto a piece of paper. Etching, where a waxy ground resistant to acid is, it covers the um, copper plate um, and is scratched through with an etching needle. Acid then cuts into the areas scratched by the needle into the ground and the ink in those areas is squeezed through a press onto the paper, creating this fluidly drawn line. You can see on the top right there. Then mezzotint, where the copper plate is worked over with a fine toothed instrument called a rocker, um, which can produce the fine half tones that you can see in the middle there. And then um, woodcut, the oldest form of printmaking, where the cut areas are actually the blank ones and the uncut areas take the ink um, finally, chiaroscuro woodcuts made of multiple woodcuts, the first picking out the lightest parts and working through to the darkest, chiaroscuro meaning light, dark in Italian. So when I arrived in Armagh at the beginning of this fellowship, the print that I was most excited to see was this work, uh, about 40 centimeters up, 30 across, depicting Hercules with his club, delivering a death blow to the fire-breathing giant Carcass, who has been terrorizing Italian tribes on the future site of Rome and has stolen the cattle of Geryon that Hercules is herding to Greece as part of his tenth labor. And before I came, up, I'd seen this print in reproduction many times and in books and on screens, um, but until I saw it in person, I never really realized the, the sort of the point of um, why Galt's, um, the Dutch engraver Goltzius had chosen this subject for the largest work in chiaroscuro woodcut that he produced. Um, and when I saw it in person in this, in this um, impression, it was published by um, Willem Janssen Blau uh, in six, around 1615, where the, the publisher has really exaggerated the, the contrast of the, of the different colors of ink. You can see that the lighting of this, this scene is so important because it's set in an in, inside in a cave, in the cave of Carcass, where he has stolen these cattle that you can see in the background and hidden them away. And Hercules has broken in on the top left. You can see uh, some, the, the, the hole that he's come through and the rock that he's pushed through in order to, to attack the giant. And so it's, the, the lighting is only from the, that sort of far source on the far left. And the main scene is lit by the fire emanating from the mouth of the giant carcass. And when you see this in person, you really see the color of these, um, the ink that was used, this sort of greeny, yellowy color that really conveys this sort of like eerie um, fire that this giant is breathing. He's been terrorizing all the people around Rome and, um, and you can see the skulls and some of the bones of, of them around in his cave. And, and so um, the, the, when I realized in person that the, the, the scene is lit by the fire from his mouth, it kind of takes on this tragic dimension because you're seeing, seeing a whole um, view lit by somebody's dying breath, essentially. So in that sense, it's a kind of tragic image. And um, so I really encourage you come see these prints in person because um, they have all these dimensions to them uh, that really need to be seen um, up close and in person. So um, just to give you a sense of another great work in the collection, this is um, a very different kind of interior space that's being depicted by the great French engraver, 
Robert Nantoy, one of the most powerful men of the era, sitting in his palace in 1652 um, in Paris, a huge blockbuster engraving about 70 centimeters across. And um, we might want to come back to this print later, but just to give you a sense of the, the quality of the condition, this is a large sheet that has been preserved, um, unfolded uh, in, in Armagh since its bequest to the collection, which is, which is really remarkable um, because it's hard to store something like this. And I'll give you an example of the same print in another museum. And I'm gonna be very diplomatic and not say which museum this is, but it is one of the um, largest, richest, and um, most uh, well-funded, and also one of the, with one of the greatest collections of French art in the world. And you can see that their version of this print has been folded and mounted, folded twice, which sort of um, does a disservice to the, the effect of this, this single image on a, made from a, a single enormous copper plate and printed onto a single sheet of paper and the, the sort of way that the whole thing ties together all these elements, the, the, the view, the objects and the portrait into, into a single coherent view. And then you have those creases as you have in this, this uh, example from the um, museum that I'm not going to identify. It is, it's very different to the one in Mar, which is which is perfectly preserved. So my main responsibility was finishing the cataloging of the collection. Um, this had mostly um, been done. Uh, most of the prints had been cataloged by Tisha Mulder, the library archivist. And various um, print scholars have visited the collection, uh, the late Richard Godfrey a long time ago, and more recently Eleanor Ling of the Fitzwilliam Museum, uh, the latter of whom has been extremely helpful to me. And um, over the last year, the last few hundred prints of the 4,027 uh, have been um, catalogued by me and will be uploaded online onto the online catalog soon. And the ones that I was left with were the most troublesome ones, the ones that um, that, that have uh, the least information on them about identification. So in most cases, a print would have an artist and a date on it. That, that would um, help you out a long way. Uh, if, if not, then you could identify the subject matter um, and look that up and then find prints depicting that particular saint or that particular historical event. Uh, in some cases, you don't have any information at all. Like this, this print, um, what's going on here? Well, there's a conversation going on. There's a, a man who's seated, seated, seated on a throne under a statue. And there's a sort of dog. Uh, what possible historical period could this represent? There's no name on the print. And um, in fact, this is a, a work by um, a man of the printer called Batista Franco, who created an intentionally riddling uh, problem for future catalogers like myself. And um, but fortunately, and is usually catalogued as a sort of fantasy subject. So it has to be identified really without any of that kind of helpful information. Um, another example um, is uh, a work like this, a very dense scene of a farmer's fair, but the important information of the, of the artist after whom it was made has been cropped out. Uh, you can see the name of um, David Winkerboons down on the far left in another uh, version of the same print. So these were the sorts of puzzles that I was, I was dealing with, and it was my job to solve these mysteries. And um, some of the prints in the collection uh, were works which um, had no other examples in other museums or public collections. This one by, published by Francis Francois Vivaris, um, by, uh, engraved by Nicolas Dufour, part of a series of books of flowers that Vivaris had published. Um, but this particular series, uh, otherwise not in any other public collection. Um, and this uh, view, this um, broadside, We'll play at Nicket for Three Crowns, a satire of uh, Robert Walpole promoting the work of a satirist known as Caleb. Um, broadsides are well um, documented, and so when we find an, uh, one that's uh, been unidentified previously, it's quite um, uh, quick and easy to, to, to make that identification of it as a, something new. Uh, then there were some other things, uh, landscapes by um, the Irish miniature painter Geoffrey Hamilton O'Neill uh, from 1767, something that um, doesn't appear to be in any other public collection. There's two versions of it, all on uncut sheets, as you can see here, never been framed, just as they came out of the printer shop. 
one of the other things I was looking for were clues about provenance, little, little uh, uh, by, uh, stamps or notations, things that give us a sense of where these prints were before they were in Armagh. And um, this enormous uh, work, nearly a metre high by Agostino Caracci um, from 1583, reproducing an altarpiece by Veronese in Padua. Looking over onto the reverse of this, we find in postmodal letters, these two letters, JB. JB, if you look up in a database of um, the Dutch art historian and collector Fritz Lugt, you find um, the name John Barnard, who had an enormous collection in Berkeley Square. He was really one of the most uh, foremost connoisseurs of, of prints um, in the 18th century, uh, having an, inherited an enormous fortune from his father and um, using it to collect prints like this one. Another notable um, mark on one of these prints was MF on this engraving from um, the documentation of the Galleria Justiniana that was produced in um, 1636. MF is the mark of the antiquary Martin Fuchs, president of the Royal Society from 1741 and a great scholar of Roman antiquities. The highlight of, I think, of what I um, worked on in Amar was something that I realized was uncatalogued at the very, very end of my time um, in Amar and was both very delighted to find and also uh, a little bit stressed out to find a portfolio with um, the very rev, the Dean of Armar written on it and clearly containing some highlights that have been collected together at a certain point. Um, and I'll be publishing on the contents of this finding so there'll be more information to come. But it included um, these huge expressive woodcuts by Giuseppe Scolari from around 1600. Um, but the highlight of this portfolio overall was um, this drawing after the fresco by Cavalieri d'Arpino depicting the Roman conquest of Etruria. Tullius Hostilius there, the legendary third king of Rome, is defeating a tribe of Etruscans um, after a fresco in the Palazzo dei Conservatori in Rome. And the frame of this, the way it's, this drawing has been framed identifies it sort of the early, um, the, the framing as the early 18th century by someone who has a pretty good knowledge of, of Roman painting of the 1590s because he's attributed it to Juan Cali, which is a pretty good guess. And um, I asked uh, Hugo Chapman, keeper of Italian and French drawings at the British Museum. He tentatively suggested a date at the first quarter of the 17th century for this drawing, which for its um, subject matter and its uh, effect, effects and its quality is really the highlight of, of what I've been working on in our mark. So with everything now catalogued, we have an exhibition due to open in October 21. Um, the subject matter has been chosen to be the, chronologically speaking, the first big strength of the collection, so mannerist printmaking. The title is, of the exhibition is going to be Strange Impressions, Mannerist Prints from the Rokeby Collection. And so it'll also serve as a sort of introduction to all the printmaking techniques that are sort of going to be developed over the course of um, the period covered by the Rokeby Collection to the next few centuries. In this engraving, the printmaker Cherubino Alberti has reproduced a fresco, a notoriously fugitive medium, um, a work painted on the facade of a building that was already starting to decay a few decades after its execution. The original fresco was executed in various tones of a single colour intended to evoke a character of another medium sculpture carved in relief. So to embody the gradient of tones, Carabino has not only used overlapping lines, but also swelling within lines themselves, giving the effect of contour. The result is the antithesis of the bright clarity of Michelangelo's famous version of the birth of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. Here, the creation of mankind is a mysterious event taking place in a world not yet fully illuminated. Uh, on this Page, the Florentine historian and statesman Francesco Guicciardini sets the scene for us in um, a world that he famously described as a sea whipped by winds, which um, we illustrate with some, some prints of uh, sea monsters by Giovanni Andrea Maglioli. The copper plate also offered new possibilities for architects who had previously only employed woodcuts to disseminate their ideas until the 
the 16th century. On the left, the mausoleum of Emperor Hadrian is imaginatively recreated based on the ruins that survived in the 16th century, the Castro Sant'Angelo. Labaco's treatise was the first to illustrate architecture in engraving, allowing for greater detail and three-dimensionality of shading. On the right, the teenage Girolamo Rinaldi illustrates his own lavishly embellished catafalque, or a funeral platform, for the art patron Alessandro Farnese, promoting it in print in April 1589, the week before the funeral ceremony itself. So this contrast is also useful for, distinct, for establishing the distinction between engraving and etching. And as we look for the, the tapered lines of the engraved, um, the engraved Buren, and then the, the uh, blunt ended lines um, etched and cut through with acid on the right there. This, the um, strangeness of mannerist printmaking and its fertility arguably reached an apogee with the ornamental etchings that flowed out of the Antwerp publishing house Au Quatre Vents, the sign of the four winds. These are all for funeral monuments, all fantastically implausible as designs. And the type of monuments that they depict would soon be vandalized during the iconoclastic riots of 1566 that contributed to the decline of Antwerp's importance as the financial center of Europe. And although it's too large to put in our case, the, the work by Battista Franco is another great example of this sort of strangeness of, of mannerist printmaking, this one literally depicting the kind of erudite debate that it was itself intended to inspire. Also, a good example of the combination of etching and engraving together into a single print. So by this point, you may be wondering how this collection came to be in Armagh. The person you've already seen is the figure in the middle, Archbishop Richard Robinson, Baron of Oakby. But I wanted to contextualize him in terms of two other people who he knew, his older brother, Sir Thomas Robinson, first baronet, and his distant cousin and close friend, Elizabeth Montague, Nate Robinson, um, who uh, he swapped his the Reynolds portraits with. And you can both see both of those there. Uh, Richard gave his to Elizabeth and Elizabeth gave the one of herself, um, now lost, but they're depicted in the Mexitant um, to Richard. Starting with um, Thomas, who you see there in a portrait by Franz van der Meyen, the National Portrait Gallery of 1750. He was um, the, probably the most famous of these people um, at the time, long Sir Thomas Robinson there in a caricature, now at the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven. He went on his grand tour in 1729 to 31, was made baronet on his return, and was all set for a great career as a, a Whig politician. Um, he went to Exeter College, Oxford, which is the, which was the Whig bastion at that time. And um, it's important to say that also uh, these, when we go around the library, we see these green bindings. They're, they're something to look out for. Those seem to identify his books in the collection, which are mostly architectural volumes. He was a, an amateur Palladian architect who built substantial works during his um, his earlier life, and. Um, was a great patron of, of architecture as well. Um, he was also the governor of Barbados for a few years in the 1740s, and the woman he married there owned enslaved people. So like many member, members of the Whig elite in the period, he was directly involved in the exploitation of enslaved peoples. Now this is important context also for the fact of the collection. Um, Long Sir Thomas is a potential source of prints in the collection. However, I think that the particularly French character of these prints doesn't really fit with um, a Whig figure of this period. Uh, Francophilia was not something that they were um, characterized by. And so I think that while Long Sir Thomas is clearly a very important influence on his younger brother, he is not the source of many of the prints in the collection or its, or its general form that it has taken. Um, as the Rokeby collection. The other person um, of these three Robinsons that I wanted to introduce you to is Elizabeth Montague, um, now probably the best known of them, who, um, whose salon in London uh, on Hill Street, here with two great obelisks to tell you that you're going to have very serious conversations inside, is um, was where that house was where 
Richard Robinson would have met um, all the great artists of the period and Reynolds where, who painted his portrait a few times and um, would have introduced him to, to the collectors. So John Barnett, for example, just up the street in Berkeley Square. So finally, we come to Archbishop Richard Robinson Baron Ropley. Now he was never, he was a younger son. He was never intended to have a political career. So it was all right to send him to um, the Tory College of Christchurch College, Oxford. Um, and here is, uh, here is, he is that portrait in context in Bordeaux, where it is at the moment um, in a display of the British collection uh, at the Musée des Beaux-Arts. Um, and he was a great patron of, of art. And um, here's another painting of him um, by Angelica Kaufman and um, a well-known artist at, at the time and today, but a very um, striking person to choose to paint his portrait. She was um, a, still in her twenties when she visited Dublin and the types of works that people commissioned her to paint were mostly young women like herself or um, families. Um, and so what Robinson did was, was quite remarkable in, in commissioning her first major portrait of a man that was exhibited at the Royal Academy. And I think um, the result is, is, is very clear. She's come up with a much more warm, psychologically penetrating um, portrait of him than I think um, other artists at the time might have produced. This portrait now on display um, in the observatory in Armagh, owned by the library since the 1970s. Richard Robinson was a great collector of titles, including Baron Rokeby. Uh, here he is um, in the portrait that in, in possession of Elizabeth Montague had this added to it, the, the Order of St. Patrick. It's important to say about him that these um, titles that he acquired and these various positions were, were instrumental in a way. They allowed him to patronize architecture, pay, like do all these building projects in Armagh and get them through the Irish Parliament in Dublin um, as he was in the House of Lords. Bills like the one that founded the library here in the background to the view looks like what looks like um, the spire to the, the, that he wanted to add to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Armagh, but um, never managed to, to do that. But he managed to do so much else in, in Armagh. And um, he also patronized printmaking. So here is a mezzotint of him in all those half tones that you could see made by the, the best mezzotint of the time, John Raphael Smith in 1775 the year of the display of this portrait in the Royal Academy and identifying its current location as um, the possession of Elizabeth Montague. And the painting seen in this context can really be seen as like, a, it's intended for mezzotint, these gloves that he wears so perfectly transfer into the sort of velvety medium of mezzotint. So Archbishop Robinson, he was in close contact with Reynolds. He, um, the president of the Royal Academy, Joshua Reynolds, delivered these lectures. Uh, this is a, a copy that's in the Armagh Robinson Library, dedicated to Robinson by the author, to his grace, the primate of all Ireland. And just confirming that um, they had a respectful relationship. This was not just any other sitter that he had, that Reynolds had. And um, finally, a note that I found tucked into a page in um, the Ceremonies and Customs of Bernard Picard, um, that great work of uh, 18th century tolerance um, with religious ceremonies of the world depicted in engravings. And this note records um, apparently that uh, uh, the, the volume is being returned to the owner, identified as my lord, that can't be Sir Thomas of Baronet would not be addressed by that, but um, Baron Rokeby would. Uh, and it discusses um, someone called Flynn, some possibly a Dublin bookseller of that name, called Lawrence Flynn, and comparing the English editions engravings by Claude Dubosc with those of the French edition by Bernard Picard himself. And this confirms that the prints in the volume were very important to Robinson, almost certainly, and the, the, the addressee of this note. 
and were um, that he had chosen the French edition for having the superior engravings to be in his collection. And let's just see one of um, some of those there. These, um, these positive depictions of different types of religious ceremony as they were around the world, produced um, by Huguenot refugees. So, the looking back to why Robinson becomes interested in print, we have to go to his uh, his um, education at back at Christchurch, where these two Tory collectors and um, architects and scholars were um, very prominent. Um, the collection at Christchurch that Robinson would have encountered was that of uh, the late Henry Aldrich, who um, was Dean of Christchurch um, since the Glorious Revolution, and made it the center of conservative Tory opposition to uh, the new Whig regime. He had more than 2,000 engravings in his collection that are now still at Christchurch, um, while also being the builder of Peckwater Quadrangle. Uh, while Robinson was at the university, George Clark was the inheritor of Aldrich's status as the principal aesthetic um, force in the university. Clark was, um, had been on a tour of, the, of Northern Europe and um, he was a fellow of all souls, but gave his collection to the college where it is now Worcester College. And um, both of these figures were, were Tories, they were both um, Francophile and so looking for the type of print that was in both of, both of their collections and was also in that of Robinson. Um, one example is this view, um, part of a series of prints by Charles Simonneau and Bernard Picard of the tomb of Cardinal Richelieu, sculpted by Girardon from 1675 to 95 in the Church of La Sorbonne in Paris. So this is the kind of subject that um, a Whig like Richard's brother, Sir Thomas, would probably not have been interested in as, um, as an example of the, the sort of the French uh, autocratic government um, uh, of, of the 17th century. And, and so I think we can say that uh, this, is the, this is very characteristic, however, of, of the Rokeby collection that's interested in the 17th century France and its great heroes. And so that's further, further confirmation, I think, that there's something that's distinctively Richard who is the, the force behind this, this print collection. Now, Aldrich and Clark don't have a, a direct presence in the collection, but their precedents do in the 17th century France. Um, so Pierre Seguier and Cardinal Mazarin, uh, these two um, both importantly founded famous public libraries in Paris uh, in the 1640s and 50s. Famous places, um, famous collections that would have been direct precedents for what Archbishop Richard Robinson did when he established that the library in Armagh should be a public library. The, they were the subject of this display that I put together for European Heritage Open Day. And we could just quickly go through some of the objects in it. Um, the great portrait of Mazarin by Robert Nantoy in the um, hotel, now the Hotel du Boeuf, where you can go and see the print collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale. He, um, he, he commissioned Nantoy to produce this print and you can just really appreciate all the, the textures, all the, the, the way that he ties this whole print together with all these different engraving techniques but never sacrificing, I think, the, the core of it, the portrait, which is, which is um, very carefully and elegantly done um, in the psychological, but also very commanding. A real blockbuster in the collection. But um, also the, this very different one of his librarian, Gabriel Naudet, and um, also a volume from the, um, that was given as a prize by the Collège Mazarin that um, he bequeathed, uh, part of, which he had the library that he bequeathed. And um, similarly, Richard Robinson also planned to have a, a sort of college um, in Armagh that never 
that never transpired. But both of these prints um, were executed by a printmaker who is very associated with this time in France and also the most represented single printmaker in the collection, Claude Mellon. And um, the allegory on the right, just to explain that, the obelisk represents the New Testament with this love heart of flowers uh, on top of the Old Testament, the, the more severe um, Hebrew text on, compared to the Greek text on the obelisk. Then we come to Pierre Seguier, Chancellor of France under Louis XIII and Louis XIV, an ally and sometimes not an ally of Cardinal Mazarin and builder of the Hotel Seguier. According to a poem of the time, both rich and poor could study there. And it was decorated with a series of paintings by Simon Vouet, the artist's most extensive work, which are represented in the Rokeby collection in a comprehensive set of prints by Michel Doigny. Um, wonderful combination here you can see of etching and engraving to create a sort of spontaneity uh, to this um, representation of the fresco. I mean, from not fresco, but the, the, the ceiling painting that um, conveys some of the, those paint pictorial qualities that have now all been lost since the um, Hotel Seguier was demolished and, during the Second Empire. Finally, um, this catalogue of the library of Seguier, it's specifically its Greek manuscripts that was produced by um, the founder of paleography, Bernard de Montfaucon, which um, was in, which is um, part of Omar Robinson Library, and has on its um, first page this wonderful view of the library in use in, in the 1710s, with all these people wanting to uh, consult it, discuss things there, even bring your child to consult a Greek manuscript and get them into the world of paleography at an early age. And I just wanted to contrast that with uh, this view, uh, con exactly contemporary, I think, of um, catalogue of the uh, Syriac manuscripts in the Vatican, a very, very different kind of portrayal of a library of that time on the bottom there. So returning to this theme of the, of the public nature of Amar Robinson Library, um, this is the rule, rules that were produced in 1795 by the governors and guardians, in which we find that the prints are among those objects that cannot be borrowed. And that confirms that they could be consulted. And then we have something that came shortly after this, a document that is signed by all the people who came into the library. So one of those names that you might be able to see on the right, J.A. Hamilton P. Malbrack, Freebendary of Malbrack, he was the um, curator of the observatory from 1790 and um, was one of these first visitors into the library sometime after 1795. And this document is particularly interesting to me because it, it is something that's quite unusual at this time, because a print collection or library was usually somewhere that would be consulted by appointment. But Archbishop Richard Robinson, he stated that he wanted the library to be accessible at opening hours. So you did not have to make an appointment. You did not have to write to somebody and be judged. You could just come in, write your name down, and um, then have access to the library, which to me is much more authentically public than the equivalent um, system um, that was, uh, at, for example, the British Museum in London at the time. Um, I asked Anthony Griffiths, if, uh, who was a great print scholar of, um, of our time and the authority on the subject, like, what, was there any other print collection that was in a library that was open not by appointment, but at opening hours. And he said the only other example was the French Royal Collection in Paris. So what you would find at the library, just to put the prints into context, was um, not just the books, but other things that Archbishop Robinson bequeathed along with the prints, which are housed all together in these three 
fantastic cabinets that were designed by um, Thomas Cooley, the architect of the original library. In the center, um, a series of the gem impressions by James Tassi, who collected impressions of the great engraved gems from antiquity in the collections of Europe and produced casts that he brought together. For example, the very famous Strozzi Medusa, which you can see here in the British Museum, and then in Tassi's version alongside others um, that have similar iconography of Medusa. So if you're reading uh, your Ovid or whatever, and you come to a part about Medusa and you want to know what she looked like, you can see what the ancient world really, really thought of her looking like. Then the other things we have are more French Grand Siècle, Louis, um, Louis XIV's medallic history in reproduction on, in the left cabinet. And on the right, more about Rome. So this is the um, coins from the um, era of Marcus Aurelius, but there's a whole series of Roman coins that are preserved at the library as well. So the prints were somewhere else. We don't have a record of their location. And of course, Archbishop Robinson's papers were burned, so we don't know exactly how he thought they were gonna be arranged. The only um, clues, I think, are this series of portfolios which survive at the library. I should say these were um, going to be thrown out and Carol Conlon of the library today saved them from um, being lost to us forever. And, and that was a great service because to me, these seem to be the potentially the original portfolios in which the prints were kept. Um, this marbled paper that they are um, bound in is the same that is used for Archbishop Robinson's um, copy of the Society of Dilettantes Ionian Antiquities, which he has his book plate in. So possibly the original portfolios, and they have these uh, various levels of annotation on them, um, sort of palimpsest of attempts at cataloging. And um, this one, Art Urbain to Raphael and Views of Flanders, and has then been rearranged to include, it looks like, um, prints after the paintings of Vure. So uh, other ones, um, Venice, uh, Guido Reni, Caracci, Poussin duplicates damaged. Now, with all of this context, I think we can come back to this amazing work by Goltzius that I began with. Um, and just talk about, I now see it in another context uh, that makes it a perfect fit for this collection. Um, because Hercules is returning to Greece during, during this episode, he's returning to Greece, uh, going via the future site of Rome. And defeating this fire-breathing giant is a, sort of a, um, you know, it's an episode in his, his life. He doesn't spend that much time in Italy, he's the Greek hero. But it's very important for Rome because defeating this fire-breathing monster was essential to the foundation of the future city by Romulus and Remus. And so in a way, what Goltius has, has chosen to depict here is a foundation myth, the foundation of, of, the, of the city of Rome. And obviously there are a lot of problematic dimensions to the theme of, of the Roman Empire in modern Europe. But I think that um, one point of view uh, to take is that this collection, just like this print, it's, it's intended to depict a, a beginning rather than an end. Uh, it's, it's foundational in that sense that, that we invite you to come to the library to see these prints in person and to explore them as, um, as, a, as a beginning of your experience and, and something to, to discover and to, to work with and, and to look, look into the future with and to find your own meanings in and to, to find, uh, find sources for creativity as well. The most repeated print um, in the collection is this view by Baudet of the Roman Road, the work now in the Dulwich Picture Gallery. It's about a meter across, a really huge masterpiece and um, part of a series. Um, in this particular case, a contrast with a, with a sort of Greek road, which is meandering and this one, the Roman Road, completely straight. Um, so again, a, a sort of image of a, of a, of a starting point 
And, um, but also I wanted to identify it because the original painting by Poussin is in the Dulwich Picture Gallery, um, which opened in 1817 and is always described as Britain's first purpose-built public art gallery, which I think is certainly true, certainly undisputed, but I would say possibly the first public art gallery in the United Kingdom might be the one in Armagh, I would like to, to propose. Now, we're still public, you just have to make an appointment because of coronavirus, but you are, you are, when you come in and you look at the prints, you're participating in, in the longest tradition of public visiting um, a print collection, and um, hopefully it is only the beginning of this journey. So in this talk, we've seen the kinds of um, prints that are in the Rokeby collection, and we've explored a little bit about the uh, possible context for their acquisition and how they came to be at the library. This is the first in a series of talks. In November, Kate Hurd will be talking about the collection and discussing some of the earlier collections that it itself encapsulates. And then early in 2022, uh, we'll be hearing from Anthony Griffiths, who'll be talking about the phenomenon of French collecting. And finally, Eleanor Ling will be uh, looking at a parallel collection, also with an Irish context, uh, the Fitzwilliam print albums, that are now at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge in England. Um, and I hope you will all join us on this, this journey of discovery um, for the Rugby collection. Thank you very much. <laughs>